we're ready to begin. Hi, everyone. Thank you for sharing some time with us today. I'm Amy Hewitt, Executive Director here at the Scleroderma Research Foundation. I'm honored to be a part of today's webinar with a special guest who joins us from the National Institutes of Health, the world's largest investor in medical research. Whether this is your first SRF webinar or if you've logged on before, please know that all of our webinars can be viewed on our website at sclerodermaresearch.org. In addition to the webinars, I encourage you to browse our expanding library of research and patient-related news. Each of these resources is available to you at no cost. We aim to provide as much information as possible to educate you and the entire scleroderma community. As we've said before, it's important to us that we deliver the content you want, so take a minute to share your thoughts by sending a comment via email or calling our offices. We welcome your feedback and use it to help make our web website and programs more useful for everyone. Of course, we also appreciate your support. The SRF relies exclusively on our donors to speed progress toward a cure, so please consider making a donation after our time together today. The best way to help patients is to fund the most promising research that will lead to new therapies and a cure. Today's webinar is made possible by generous grants from Gilead Sciences, Metamune, and Novartis. It will focus on one of the most important parts of the research process, one in which we can all play a vital and life-saving role, clinical trials. In the next 30 to 40 minutes, I expect we'll all learn a lot more about clinical trials. After that, we'll have plenty of time to answer your questions. Due to the number of participants joining us today, the phone lines have all been muted. If you have a question, please use the chat box in the conference window. Remember that our webinars are for general information only, and no information provided is considered personal medical advice. That said, we will not be able to answer questions pertaining to personal symptoms. Scleroderma affects everyone differently, and it's important that patients seek care from a licensed rheumatologist or other specialist. It's great to have you with us, and my pleasure to introduce our special guest, Denora Dominguez. She is Chief of the Office of Patient Recruitment at the National Institutes of Health Clinical Center. She earned a degree in nursing from the University of Rhode Island and has more than 15 years of experience in the field. Ms. Dominguez is a well-published nurse practitioner and recently received the Clinical Center Director's Award for her work in re-engineering public inquiry response for clinical research participation. She is also a recipient of a NIH Silver Plain Language Clear Communication Award. Of her work in the Clinical Center at the NIH, she says, this is where research done today becomes the treatments of tomorrow. Clinical research provides individuals with more choices and studies done today will help generations to come. It is now my pleasure to introduce her as she presents Clinical Trials, Consider the Possibilities. Ladies and gentlemen, I welcome Denora Dominguez. Denora, I'm going to head it over to you. Thank you, Amy, and thank you're, you. You're welcome. It's a pleasure to have you here today. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you all today, um, and I look forward to uh, hopefully a very interactive discussion after the presentation, um, so please have those questions ready for us. So um, we are going to talk a little bit today about let me make sure that I've got this right here. Okay. Um, okay, here we go. So we're going to talk a little bit about today about the NIH uh, and then talk a little bit about the clinical center, which is the hospital that's on campus, and then really talk uh, about the clinical research and the possibilities, and then we'll talk and look at some of the opportunities finding clinical trials and how to work that. And someone just chatted, can you uh, please speak up? Can you, can you hear me now? Is that better? Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and continue. So this slide here gives you a sort of a, a, a quick glimpse of what the campus looks like. We're in Bethesda, Maryland, about 14 miles from Washington, D.C., and um, all of these are the different buildings that are associated, but this is all the hospital um, here that I'm, that I'm pointing at to here. So just wanted to give you a, a glimpse of that and a little bit of, of history was that we started out in um, 1887 in the state of New York, uh, moved to this location in Bethesda, Maryland in 1904, and it was in 1996 that clinical trials information was placed on the web for the first time. Uh, and we now have a new hospital, which is your next slide uh, that was opened in 2004. And we have over 1,000 studies going on at any given time. And the hospital houses 242 beds and 90-day hospital stations, and that's the facility that you see here now. So we do have patients that come to us from all over the world. The care provided to the patients while they're participating in a clinical study here on campus, as we call it, is at no cost to the patients. 
Um, so something to, to keep in mind as we go through the searching and so forth. So let's talk a little bit about the clinical research and the concept of the clinical research. And, you know, the idea for a, a clinical research study, also known as a clinical trial, really often originates in a lab. Um, it helps us gain insights and answers about the safety and effectiveness of, of a drug or a therapy or a different type of mechanism of conducting uh, an X-ray or an MRI. So it, it also requires complex and rigorous testing and collaboration with communities that are affected by this disease. So we need to really work closely together with folks that are affected with whatever we are studying at that moment. And also, if you think about the clinical research piece, it's, it opens new doors to finding ways to diagnose, um, to prevent, to treat, or to cure diseases and disability. But the bottom line of all of these wonderful points here is that clinical trial participation of the volunteers is what's essential to help us find answers. If we don't have the participation of the volunteers, um, then it's very difficult to take any of these pieces and, and bring it to, to, um, to pass. So what type of volunteers are we referring to when we talk about clinical trials and, and clinical research? We really have two different types of, of participants, and it's those that are called patient volunteers, and that's a volunteer with a known health problem. They participate in research to better understand, like we said previously, a diagnose, treat, or cure a particular disease or condition. Participation may or may not benefit that individual study volunteer. Um, so it's really for the movement towards so the science and the understanding of the science and the, and the research questions that be, that's being asked. And then we also have individuals that participate as healthy volunteers or otherwise also known as normal controls or normal volunteers. And those are individuals that have no known significant health problems. And the standard is to provide compensation to those individuals for their time and inconvenience of participating in a clinical trial. So that gives you a sense of the two types of volunteers, if you will, that, that participate in the trials. So when we look at clinical trials, there's a, a, quite a few variety of, of of options, if you will, that we can consider. There are screening clinical trials, there are natural history clinical trials, there are other clinical trials such as training clinical trials or long-term uh, clinical trials or looking at the past of, of some data that's been collected um, in clinical trials. And then there are the clinical trials and their phases, and those phases are one through four. And those clinical trials are the ones that we're really talking about today as well as the screening, the screening clinical trials. So when we look at the types of, of, of trials, the screening trials test the best way to detect certain disease or a health condition. The natural history studies um, or trials provide valuable information about how diseases and health progresses through a stage, through 10 years, through five years, whatever the protocol is looking for and the researcher is, has written up. The prevention trials look for better ways to prevent a disease in people who have never had the disease or to prevent the disease from returning or prevent from disease from progressing if possible. Then the qual there's other types of clinical trials, and these are some of the other ones we talked about, the quality of life trials or what we call supportive care trials. Those are to explore and measure ways to improve the comfort and the quality of life of individuals with a chronic illness. There are treatment trials, there are diagnostic trials. Um, the treatment trials are looking at potentially new treatments. And when we say potentially new, it means that it has not been approved by the FDA. It's still under research, but it is considered to be a potentially uh, a treatment that will become uh, an option. So new combinations of drugs could be what those tr uh, treatment trials are looking at or a new approach to surgery or a new approach, approach to radiation therapy. So it may not necessarily be a brand new medication, but a medication that's been used for something else and that now is being studied for a different type of condition. 
test or in a different combination. We also have diagnostic trials. These are to determine better tests or procedures for diagnosing a particular disease or condition. So it's looking at something like a CAT scan or an X-ray or an MRI, and is there a different mechanism, is there a different uh, procedure that can be used to diagnose that particular uh, condition. Then when we look at uh, the phases of clinical trials, so I said there were four different phases of clinical trial, and there actually is also a phase zero clinical trial, which is the very first time as well as similar to the phase one, um, but we won't get into that as much because really the majority you're looking for are the phase one through phase four clinical trials. So your phase one clinical trial is looking the first time testing a potential new drug, whether it's a, a pill or it's an IV or an injection, what have you, but a new medication, a new compound, if you will, with a small number of volunteers. And when we say small, we're ranging anywhere between 20 to 80, but sometimes it could be a little bit less than that, and each group receives a little bit higher medication level. Sometimes it could be a little bit more than 80. So those are all, that's all pieces of information that would be in the consent and in the discussion that you have the, with the research team. But the phase one is first time testing. It's usually with a small number of volunteers and it's for best dosage and potential side effects. So what we're trying to discover there is what's the best dose to give the person with this condition and what are the potential side effects. The phase two is testing a drug with a known dose and side effect with a larger number of volunteers. So I apologize, I'm not going to try to, okay. Um, so phase two is testing a drug with a known dose and, a, and side effects with a larger number of volunteers. So it's really learning more about side effects, how the body uses the drug, and how the drug helps the condition. So here we're looking for individuals, um, anywhere between 100 to 300 individuals. And again, it really depends on the, the, the medication. It depends on the, on the type of condition. This, these numbers are averages. So once we, we're looking at phase two, we know what the side effects are pretty much with the, and the dosage is pretty known, but now we want to see are there other things that were not discovered or did not occur. How does the body use this medication and how does the, this medication now help the condition? Your phase three and phase four clinical trials, your phase three, the drug or treatment is administered to a much larger number of individuals. And this is where you can go to a variety of different institutions throughout the country that may be doing a clinical trial on this particular condition. And that'll be key when you look at, my, uh, at the next slide. Well, so you may not necessarily need to be in your home state. You can go to a trial that's closer um, you know, within driving distance at another state or across the country because they're doing a multi-center clinical trial. And then your phase four is after a drug is licensed and approved by the FDA, researchers tracked how safe is it. They're seeking any other information about risk and benefits and really the best way to use this medication. So you will also see that phase four uh, provides you opportunities to go elsewhere that's not in your immediate area if, that, um, if that's the case. So here I pulled out from the, what we have, the clinicaltrials.gov website. And these are, when you go on to um, this website, you'll see that there are 62 studies that are found that are for scleroderma. So these are scleroderma studies in the United States. And you can see by the map the different types, uh, the different areas that um, have the studies. So when you go on to the clinicaltrials.gov website, you can actually type in the diagnosis that you're looking for, the diagnosis that you're looking for, and then once you find that, you can narrow it down by specific criteria. You can narrow it down by specific area or by specific institution. So you can place that information in there, and they would give you uh, they would give you that inf that that would pop up to see for you to see. Is it is it better to hear? Or is it a little bit better hearing me now? Okay. Okay, so this is a particular example, for example. So when, you, when you're 
Thank you. I just wanted to make sure. Um, so when you're looking for a clinical trial, let's say that you, when you're on the clinicaltrials.gov website, this is the type of information, the NCT that's at the top of the slide, the NCT number is what w is, is called, and that's the number that would be identified in the clinicaltrials.gov website, that, that last slide that had all the, that had the map with all of the different um, with all the different areas that have studies for, clinical, for scleroderma. If you're going on to the NIH website, it's the 03, it's the, zero, the zero 03 number here that would, give you, um, that would give you the study information that you would need. And then this gives you the, eight, the number that you would call to find out about the study. So this is an example where we're looking for individuals that have scleroderma as well as other autoimmune diseases and what some of the eligibility criteria is and some of the information about the study um, and the facts about the study. So if you are looking on clinicaltrials.gov, it's the NCT number at the top of the page. Or if you're looking onto the NIH website, it's the website, it's the study number that's on the left side of the page. And some of the things that we've talked about for this particular study, for example, some of the objectives for this study is identification and confirmation of genetic and environmental risk factors for systemic rheumatic diseases. Um, they're looking at gene environment interactions. They're looking to just better understanding of the systemic rheumatic diseases and development of a clinical database and blood and urine specimen uh, repository for future research. So those are the sorts of points that you would be able to find when you went on to the website and found a particular study. Now, if there is not web uh, availability, the 800 number that we also answer is an area that you can then um, that you can then call us and we would go through this information with you. Some of the different websites where you can find information that we talked about would be the NIH Health Information, if you're looking for information about just different health pieces. Um, PubMed is also available, Medline Plus in English as well as in Espanol, that give you information about the particular condition that you might be looking for or medication that you're looking for. And then the clinicaltrials.gov, which we talked about. And this is what the clinicaltrials.gov website looks like. So this is what we were referring to earlier, where if you, if you go here, and you type in the name, and it gives you the example here of heart attack in Los Angeles, but you could certainly change that to anything you'd like. It would give you, the results would give you with those two pieces. If you're looking to see for search, see the studies on a map, like I showed you previously, you would click there, and all of the studies that come up on your results would show up there. And then there's advanced searches. So if you are a little bit more specific, if you know more specifically what you're looking for, if you're looking for a particular medication that perhaps is being studied, if you're looking for a particular investigator or author that you know writes and has studied the particular condition you're looking for, you would go under the advanced search, um, and that would give you much more specific a specific outcome. If also the other piece that you might be interested in is if you're looking at how to find results of studies. So all federally funded studies that are um, listed on clinicaltrials.gov must also enter their results there. So that's another good place to find out about um, what's happened to the studies and what are the results of those. Some of the other options that we have available for you to provide information on the studies that were being conducted and what's happening here in Bethesda is Facebook. We do have a Facebook page. We do have also a Twitter handle. We, are, we do have podcasting. There is a YouTube channel. And there's also an email alert system that's called GovDelivery. And with GovDelivery, if you go onto our website on the right-hand side, you'll see sign up for email alerts. So anytime that there is any new information on the topics that you've selected, once you sign up, you would receive, new, you would receive an email alert to let you know that there's new information information that's come up on whatever topic you've selected. And that's controlled by you, the user, if you'd like it weekly, if you'd like it monthly or daily, anytime that there's information provided, uh, information updated. The next website, and that information is 
um, that, in, that website is down here, is the NIH Clinical Research Trials in You, and that's where you can go to sort of look at some volunteer stories. You can look at some researcher stories. Uh, this area here on the lower right side is what we call promotional materials, but that's information that you can select different posters that talk a little bit about clinical trials and just information on sharing um, information on clinical trials, a glossary of common terms, some different educational resources, an area for your healthcare provider. So we really like to look at that as your entry way into the world of clinical research trials and use. So an excellent tool for you to keep to, to consider why should I participate in a clinical trial, see if there are volunteer stories, um, or what are some of the researcher stories that are dealing, that are dealing with um, my particular area of interest or not my particular area of interest, but something else that might pique your, your uh, attention. Then the final page that I wanted to share with you this morning or this afternoon for, yes, this morning afternoon um, is what we call, is called Research Match. And Research Match is a tool that we are using in conjunction with our colleagues and partners at Vanderbilt through our Clinical Translational Science Awards and where individuals like you and I go in and we sign into Research Match, we create a profile. And that information is housed there until there is a researcher that is part of this group of uh, researchers and institutions and that is interested in a particular condition or a particular group of individuals. If your information comes up, and by your information I mean your demographic information, your age, your gender, your um, ethnicity, your diagnosis comes up and the researcher decides to send an email to you, you receive an email to let you know about the study and then you decide if you'd like to release your information to the researcher via research match. So it's a little bit different than what we're looking at when we look at clinicaltrials.gov or our website called Search the Studies, where we as the users go in and are looking for individual studies. Here, we place our, we as the user, as the potential participant, potential volunteer, enter our information. That information is in a secure place until it's matched, if you will, with a particular research interest. And we're still given the option, do we want to share our information with this group or do we not want to share our information at this time? And that is researchmatch.org. Okay. And finally, the last piece that I wanted to talk about for a couple of minutes, it's really that we started off with talking a little bit about clinical research, how it, how it develops, how it works, and that really clinical trial participation of volunteers is essential. And we understand that that participation is essential and that it's going to take time relationship and trust. It takes time to build that relationship. It takes relationship to build trust. And that's the piece that we want to convey, that we're here to answer questions, to have a conversation, to provide the tools that we have so that you're able to look at the information and then decide, is this something that you may be interested in pursuing with your health care provider or be interested in ha calling us to find out what's necessary or what it entails to participate, but really to think and to consider that there is a possibility that there's a clinical trial out there for you to not only participate, that, but that may very well help move this whole research enterprise forward into finding the answers that we need um, in today's variety of different conditions. And that is my presentation, Amy. So I am happy to have you guide me through sort of what are the questions that you'd like me to answer. Absolutely, absolutely, and thank you. Thank you, a great presentation, um, a lot of helpful information. Um, we do have about 15 minutes left, and, and we'll use that time to answer the questions that have come in. Um, so go ahead and type them into the chat window if you have them. Um, I do have a quick question for you. Um, can you walk us through the typical process after someone signs up for a clinical trial? Oh, absolutely. So, 
So our, our office, part of what our office does is also answer all of the calls and the emails. So if you send an email through clinicaltrials.gov or search the studies um, or the other website that I, that I presented to you, that email will come into our office where one of our nurses will read the email and answer that email. And in that email, an, in that email answer or that phone call will be the next step. So the next steps would be to sit down w with us over the telephone and we would provide some preliminary screening questions if we have those questions for you. Um, and those may range from uh, date of birth, ethnicity, uh, mailing address, what's the best time of day to contact you, to what was your last lab value on X, Y, and Z, really depending on the study, because as I said, we, had over 50, we have over 1,500 studies going on at any given time here on campus. Once the person um, provides that information to us, the, the, the computer basically tells us this person's information can be forwarded on to the research team or this person's information does not need to be forwarded on to the research team. Unfortunately, we're not able to know why, why we can or cannot. Um, so if somebody would like to know why their information is not being forwarded, we certainly send them straight to the research team who can answer that question much, much more elegantly, um, much more in detail than we can. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So once, the, once we send the information over to the research team, it's the research team that then sometimes will send um, a letter to you to tell you these are the next steps that I need, that they need. Perhaps they'll need some information from your health care provider. They'll need some records or some lab values. Or perhaps they just need you to fill out a questionnaire, depending, again, on the study and the requirements. Or it's a conversation with the research team immediately over the phone, and then it's determined, okay, we can set up a date for screening for you to come in, or we can set up a date um, for us to have another discussion. And so the informed consent, which really we like to help folks understand that informed consent is not just a one-time deal and it is not a one-time uh, moment where you sign a piece of paper, but it's really a process where the individual is involved in keeping informed about all of the steps of being a participant in a clinical trial. So many, in, many of our research teams send out the informed consent once they've spoken to the potential participant so that they can read that, they can share that with their health care provider, they can share that with their family members that assist in making health decisions. And so once that's, if that's the process, then there's, there's time set up with the research team to either invite you to come in for a screening visit, invite you to come in to be signed and consented and, and sign a consent form, and then start the process there. Some of our studies last where you only need to come once every couple of months, once a year. Some studies require that you live within four hours of the NIH because it requires weekly visits, daily visits. We do have, of course, the hospital as well as a family lodge as well as a children's inn, which both are somewhat similar to like a Ronald McDonald house where individuals can stay if it's a child who's the patient, their health, you know, their, their, their caregiver can stay with them in that facility. And if it's an adult and they need a, a caregiver, they can stay in that facility if it's appropriate and, you know, walk work through our social work department and our and our team of different health care providers that are part of the research team. Okay, okay. Um, we have a question from Nita. She asked about, um, you mentioned that federally funded trial results are posted on the website. What about private industry trials? Do they have to post their results as well? Um, thank you, Nita. So those are, if the study is listed on clinicaltrials.gov, the results should be posted there. Not all, not all privately funded studies are listed on clinicaltrials.gov. So all federally funded are, and results are listed there, um, as well as whatever else is listed there, but not all, not, not all private are listed. Um, you also mentioned, too, earlier in the, in the session, um, the NIH uh, versus the clinicaltrials.gov. Are those all the same um, research studies, or do they represent different? So they are all the same, and in the sense everything that is on clinicaltrials.gov that is at the NIH in Bethesda, Maryland, is also is listed there. And everything that um, is on search the studies is only what's being done at the NIH 
the clinical center in Bethesda, Maryland. So if you know that what you're looking for is for something being done here in Bethesda, you can certainly narrow that down by going straight to search the studies. If you're looking for something in California, Idaho, Texas, you may want to consider clinicaltrials.gov to see what are all of your options and then narrow that down by state if you're looking for a particular state. Okay, okay. Um, we have Carmen is asking, um, she has a sister in the Dominican Republic and wants to be a part of a clinical trial study. Is, that, is, uh, is there some way that she can find out more information um, about, you know, if she's going to be here just for a short period of time or is it really you have to commit to a, a long-term, uh, make a long-term commitment to a clinical trial? Okay. So our patients do come to us from all over the country or all over the world, um, including the Dominican Republic, which is also my homeland. Um, so uh, we do have patients that come from the Dominican Republic and any other part of the world. It really all depends on the study. There are some studies where the individual um, needs to come on a yearly basis. There are some studies where the individual needs to stay for three months in the area. There are other studies where the individual comes every six months, every four months. So it really depends on the study. What we tell folks when they call us and ask us if, you know, if I have a family member that's in another country or even if I have a family member in California, is this even worth it? We always encourage you to have a conversation with the research team if there's a potential match there, of course, to have the conversation because they'll be able to tell you the reasons why you need to return turn? Um, is there flexibility in the sense of if it's not, you know, if it's every month, can you come every two months because you're out of the country? So we're not able to make those those statements up front, those are really pieces of information that we leave our colleagues the, that are part of the research team to answer on an individual basis with the, with the folks. Okay. Is there, um, I'm curious, is there paid compensation for participation, participation or are they... Um, is there living expenses that are covered or anything like that? Um, so there is compensation provided to all healthy volunteers. So any individual um, that participates in our studies as a healthy person that does receive compensation for their time and inconvenience of participating. What we are seeing is that there is more and more an increase and some compensation for patients that are participating in certain studies. And that's something that we really don't know until the study is actually up and, up and um, out in the public of what that, what, which, that, which study that is and um, are they compensating patients as well as healthy. So for healthies, there is at all times. Um, for patients, that is on a case-by-case -case study, uh, study case, not individuals, but case-by-case -case, uh, study. How, how long, do, you, um, how long do, do trials typically last, or most studies last? That varies with the phase one and phase two, and because of our screening and our natural history studies, some studies last anywhere between six months to you know a year. Others go on for many years. So it really just depends on the study. What's the goal of the study? They are reviewed on a yearly basis by what we call the Institutional Review Board, which is a group of individuals that is it's made up of not only scientists and scientific. Uh, members of the community, but also community members, also the clergy, also ethics indi individuals from the world of ethics and individuals from support groups and so forth. And so uh, each study is reviewed on a yearly basis, approved and reviewed on a yearly basis by this um, institutional review board. And sometimes the studies may go on for multiple years, other studies may go on for a couple of months, but we do tell folks when they call us or they send us an email is we do not know if tomorrow that study closes. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's not, some informa that's not information that our office is aware of, but we do know that sometimes the study is up online and we're receiving calls today and tomorrow it's closed because they've received the number of individuals or they've enrolled the number of individuals that they needed to. So we do encourage folks that if they see something that they're interested in to at least start a dialogue, to at least start a conversation with whether it's their health care provider, if they feel that that's the way that they want to start the process, or if it's with us and having a conversation directly. Because mm -hmm. we do accept self-referrals, which means that there are many studies where individuals that contact us do not need 
a um, health care provider referral, but there are other studies that they do need a referral, which means a letter that contains certain information that we tell you exactly what that information is. Uh, and it really depends, again, on the study. I think because we have so many, there are so many different varieties, but we encourage everyone, if you see something that you think you might be interested in, start the conversation because it doesn't mean that tomorrow it will be there. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm sure that this is a difficult question to answer, but how many clinical trials typically result in new, new treatments? That is a very good question, and I'm not quite sure that I would have an answer on how many result in new treatment versus what we've done through the years, and that's on, in our website in terms of some of the accomplishments that have all come from clinical trials. The first the first uh, pediatric chemotherapy, the first replacement of a heart valve, the first open heart surgery. I mean, so those, those are different things that have come out of clinical trials and have come out specifically from things that we have done here at the NIH. Um, but in terms of like, you know, 20%, 30%, I couldn't say. Okay, couldn't okay. Say Can I ask, um, so we have a question from Karen. Um, what about care following a study? Sometimes, you know, they can be stopped, um, they can stop immediately because of risks and things like that, is there a way to educate patients about a support system um, post-trial? Um, you know, I, I think that there's some uh, challenges posted with that. Right, and excellent question, Karen. So when the individuals, when, when folks come in to, to be consented, what we say, what we consider to be consented to sign the informed consent, all of that is presented to the individual. Um, what are all the potential benefits, although at, earlier in my, in my talk we talked about there really are no potential benefits, but sometimes there are potential benefits that you're going to be seen every week or that you're going to have additional um, X, Y, or Z. So what are the potential benefits? What are the potential risks? And with the potential risk, then many times it's discussed what the, well, not only many times, but they're discussed what they are, what are the possibilities of they occurring, and what in place. And so those are questions that um, on our website we do have sort of frequently asked questions to ask the research team. So that if you're considering this, we highly recommend that you look at all of those questions and have those ready to sit down and make sure that you're, that you're covering all of those with the research team. Um, because when that occurs, you want to be able to know what are your options and what, and what happens. Okay. Um, what would you say to a scleroderma patient who may be interested in a trial but, but perhaps frightened by the, the unknown? I think that the, the key that we like to, to help everyone understand is consider it as a possibility. We're not telling, we're, you know, we're not asking to sign the informed consent and, get, and come on down and pack your bags and come on down to Bethesda. Though it's a beautiful day here today, but, um, <laughs> but really just consider the possibilities and who are the individuals that uh, surround you that assist you with health care decisions or just that conversation and, and include the word clinical trial in your conversation so that when the moment arises, because it may not be um, for you right now or it may not be for your family member right this minute, but in your circle of influence, eventually someone will, will be interested or, or, or be a potential candidate for a clinical trial to consider it. Um, certainly look online if you would like, or you can certainly call our 800 number, which is at no, at no risk of absolutely we're signing you up today and you're, you're you know, signed into a clinical trial, but just information so that as we gather information and we're empowered by that information, we're able to help the bigger purpose and the bigger picture of moving the research, whether it's related to scleroderma, whether it's rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, um, cancer, moving that forward. So consider it as a possibility. You know, the, one of the questions we get asked um, frequently is somebody, it's been a long time since they've been diagnosed. You know, a patient who's um, been diagnosed with scleroderma for 10 years is not necessarily fit for a trial. Um, what other options do they have to help move medical research forward? So it depends on the study and it depends on the, on the research, the question that's being asked. Because something like um, a natural history study or a training study or a screening study or a diagnostic study, individuals are able to participate even if they are diagnosed with a condition that is either a chronic condition or a condition that, um, that has other issues associated with it. We have studies that individuals can participate in 
that have nothing to do sometimes with your primary condition. But it could be a survey. It could be something as looking at um, different mechanisms of collecting data. And that those are all pieces that are important to continue to move the whole picture of science forward. It's not only your phase one, phase two clinical trials, albeit those are, of course, very important to move forward the discoveries of new treatments and new medications, perhaps, but we can certainly look at other clinical studies that are being done. So just because there's a diagnosis does not mean that you're not able to look at other studies. So if you're interested in some other type of of study or if you have another type of condition or even a symptom, that's something that you can type in, for example, in um, clinicaltrials.gov, and it would show you what the study is and then also show what is the eligibility criteria. What do I absolutely need to have or what can I absolutely not have? Mm -hmm. And you can sort of get a sense from there, oh, Maybe I can call the 800 number. Or maybe I can send an email to this person to find out a little bit more. We always, we always caution folks, don't self-select um, yourself out. Let the researcher tell you, oh, no, at this point, this is what we're looking for, or, oh, okay, no, the, you fit into this criteria of the study. Um, sometimes we look at what we may or may not have going on with ourselves, and we think, oh, dear, no, there's, there's absolutely no study that could potentially – uh, be a match, but other times, what, so we tell folks, let the researcher or let us tell you that as we speak to you, as we ask you some questions, and we do some searching and see what's available. Um, I'm, I'm curious, if somebody doesn't have, if there's not something happening for them regionally, is that something that they could, you know, involve their rheumatologist in to say, here's this study, can you find out more about it, or, you know, is, are those options at all? Certainly involving a health care provider is, is an option, um, and many will refer you back to clinicaltrials.gov. Um, others may, may search for that themselves, but we certainly are wanting and, and like to allow the patients or the potential patients to search for themselves that information, and then if they'd like, you know, certainly take that back to their research, to their, um, to their health care provider. Many times we get calls from individuals that tell us, my health care provider just gave me this number. I'm not quite sure what I'm calling. And we sort of start from scratch because the health care provider knows about us um, and says, here, call an IH, find out if there's, st there's a study, and then come back to me. So we certainly have that scenario or the scenario where the patient has found something and says, what do I do next? And we'll say, you can print it off the web. We'll send it to you if you'd like, and you can share that with your health care provider um, because we definitely want this to be a partnership uh, between the patient, the researcher, and your health care provider. Okay. Yeah, I'm curious, are, are travel expenses um, covered in some instances for some studies? In some instances, they are, and that is a conversation that's, that is held with the research team. Um, and some instances, they are not. Some instances, they are covered for the very first tra travel for screening and then not covered for other studies, for other visits. And in other studies, the screening visit is not covered, but your repeat visits are. So it's really on a study-by-study um, case, and it's best to talk to the research team to find that out. Um, and typically, it is only from the um, continental United States, I believe, but I'm not 100% sure. Yeah, it really is amazing that, you know, it wasn't that long ago that there were only, um, you know, very few clinical trials taking place in scleroderma, and today it looks like there are 62. I mean, this is just really helping to move research progress forward. It's amazing. Um, um, you know, what, what has happened over the recent history. Absolutely, and actually that's only the United States. If you do the map worldwide, there are other studies being uh, conducted in Canada and in Europe and so forth. So there are, the number is higher than 62 actually, but I thought we'd just concentrate on the United States, but you're absolutely <laughs> right. Is there, a way, is there a way for patients to find out more about those studies that are happening? or? Absolutely. If they go onto the clinicaltrials.gov website, they can type in just the word scleroderma and search under that and then um, a look at studies that are open uh, unless they would like to just read all of the different studies because any study that's closed or not recruiting also shows up on clinicaltrials.gov. So there are mechanisms that you, can, that you can hide those, if you will, so that you're only looking at the open ones. Um, and then if they'd like to just see the, the studies that are scleroderma and, the, and can 
Canada and California, they can either use the map or they can just type in scleroderma and California or and Los Angeles, for example, and any study that's in that area would come up. Okay. So that narrows it, um, but if you know for sure that you, there's no way that, you know, you live in California and you're only going to travel to Los Angeles, then maybe you don't want to know about anything else that's happening um, but, and only want to concentrate on that. All right, all right, thank you. Well, it looks like um, the, the questions are tapering down, so I think um, we can wrap it up unless you have anything else you want to add, Denora. I think it's, it was a great session, and I want to thank you for um, your time and joining us today. Um, you know, we're all part of the scleroderma community, and only, only by joining together can we make uh, faster progress um, and search for better treatments and a cure, and I think uh, clinical trials is, is a, one of the most valuable ways to do that. Um, I'd love to keep the conversation going, so when you close the webinar window today, um, you can provide value, valuable information back to the foundation by completing the short survey. Um, you can always, also always email us or call us at 1-800-441-2873. Um, and we'd be happy to answer your questions. And I want to thank you again, Denora. It was really um, very insightful. No, thank you. I thank you for, for reaching out to us, and I thank all of your participants. I hope that it was something that was helpful, and always remember that we are here to start a conversation and really just consider the possibilities of what could be all together for all of us doing this together. So certainly you can go online and look at the, the resources or call our 800 number as well, and we're happy to, to walk you know, through the process of what is a clinical trial and what, what options are available for us, for you. Great. So thank Great. You. Thank you so much. All righty. Have a good afternoon, everyone. You too. Bye-bye.